So welcome to the museum. Um, we are standing right now in the exhibition Dine Elegance. This is actually the third in a series of special exhibitions at the museum that feature Japanese textile art. The most recent before this one was um, Kimono is Art, the Landscapes of Ichika Kabuta. And that was in 2009. So it's been a couple of years. We're excited to have this exhibition on view. Each exhibition that we do is special in its own right. And one of the things that I think is most special about this exhibition is that the work that you see around us is the work of two artists. And even more special is these artists are a father and a daughter team. And these artists are from Japan. In fact, all of the work, or most of it that you see here, has not been exhibited outside of Japan until this exhibition. And some of the pieces were actually specifically created for this exhibition. I'll point them out when we get into more specifics when we enter the next room. But first, I want you to take a look around. Just feel free to stay standing where you are, but use your eyes just to wander around the room. The work that you see on the walls right now is the work of the first artist, the father of the team. And his name is Kabuko Takaku. And Kabuko, he um, was actually an artist who was born in 1908, so an early 20th century artist, 1908 in a small town just outside of Tokyo. And as a young man, he realized he had an interest in art. And so he became an apprentice under a master textile artist. And through that education, he learned a lot of processes in working with textiles. And through his education, he gained a special interest in traditional techniques. And what he did is he sort of resurrected and reinvented a particular technique, um, indigenous Japanese wax resist dyeing, which is what you see used around us. So this technique I'm going to talk more specifically about in a second. It's a challenging, challenging technique, and I can't emphasize that enough. What I hope when I've described it in full is that it gives you a further appreciation for the type of time and effort that's gone into each of the works that we see around us. Not only was he interested in sort of making this traditional technique current, but he was also interested in current art. So he was an early 20th century artist. He was interested in what his contemporaries were doing. He was looking at the work that was happening in Europe. So early 20th century, we're talking about modern art. We're talking about movements like Cubism. So as you look around you, if you're familiar with Cubist art, works by artists like Picasso and Brock, you can probably see that influence, especially in the piece to my right. But in terms of his process, as I said, it was traditional, but it was challenging. And let me quickly describe it. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the process of batik, it's similar to the Indonesian fabric dyeing process of batik, but it actually has more challenges to it. Um, in batik, what you would do is typically you work on silk, and it's pulled taut, and you are drawing with wax. When you are done with your design work, you place it within a bath of dye, and that will color the fabric. Now, this process that Kaboku was using was tougher than that. What he did was pull the silk fabric taut, and then to color the fabric, instead of dipping it into a dye bath, he would actually brush it on every area. So in a moment when we move into this next room and you see the beautiful kimono that are filled with color in large areas, keep in mind that all of that color was applied with a brush, which to me is astounding. Um, there is also wax, to, like batik, wax is used in this process, but in this case it's used more as a sort of a force field, a barrier within which the dye is placed and made into objects and, and pictures. Um, within that dye placement, it's done in sort of a layering system. So if you're familiar with, say, the process of watercolor, think of it like that, these many layers of translucent color that are layered on top. And with those layers, it's given depth and interest. It's such a difficult process because it's done on silk, and silk, quite frankly, is not very forgiving. So if you make a mistake, there's no going back. Now, I mention this because Kaboku had the challenge of trying to find someone to work with him. He wanted an apprentice. He wanted this technique to live on beyond his time. And as I understand it, he had a tough time finding anybody that would stick with it. Fortunately, as luck would have it, he and his wife decided to have a family. 
And they adopted a three-year-old girl. They named Hisaku. And Hisaku, as she got older, her father introduced this process to her. And fortunately, she took to it. And she was extremely successful in it. So not only did he have his apprentice, but he had a family member who he knew would continue this legacy. So we're actually going to spend the rest of our time right now looking at a series that Hisaku did quite recently, starting in 1988 and just finished a year before this exhibition opened in 2011. Um, before we enter this space and take a look at it, I'll mention that uh, Kaboku was doing all of this work inspired by modern artists, but at the same time the Japanese culture and government was interested in the work that he was doing and wanted him to pursue kimono art as well and to tie in further with those traditions. So following World War II, he began working again with kimono. He shared this as well with Hisaku. And so what we're about to look at are kimono. And we're going to look at a series that Hisaku did celebrating the Four Seasons which is a centuries-old tradition in Japanese art. So she's continuing as well another tradition. But she's using the techniques that her father taught her, and she's giving her own take to them as well. So we can start getting our bodies moving a little bit. We'll head into this room, and we'll start in this corner here. We're going to do sort of a seasonal cycle around the room. Now, kimono, if you're unfamiliar, kimono are wearable works of art. We're surrounded by them right now. Kimono are robe-like objects, um, in this case made for women. But kimono are created by a series of panels of fabric that is decorated and dyed prior to being stitched together. And when you wear a kimono, you wrap it around yourself from left to right. And then to keep everything in place, you put a center sash around your middle, called the obi. So we see here in the middle here, kimono displayed, and we can see the obi right there in the middle. So the obi was just as important as the kimono. Now when you're wearing a kimono, you need to remember what time of year it, you're in. Because like our fashion rules of no white shoes after Labor Day, there are rules when it comes to making and wearing kimono. You want to make sure that you're wearing a kimono that is um, indicative of the season that you're in. So that would apply to the weight of the fabric that you wear. You'd obviously wear something heavier in the cooler months and lighter weight fabrics in the warmer months. But it also applies to the colors used in your kimono and the motifs. So as we look around at these ones, I'll point out the different floral motifs that are represented on each one. And keep in mind that those blossoms that we see, those are the blossoms of that season. And you would never, ever want to wear a spring blossom in the fall. Be very, very big fashion faux pas. <laughs> so we'll start over here with these two kimono. Each season has a set of two. We're starting here with kimono that have um, cherry blossoms adorning both. Does anybody know what season we're beginning with? Spring, that's right. In fact, the Japanese Friendship Garden here in the park just had a cherry blossom festival last month. So the cherry blossoms are a beautiful spring flower that blooms on trees. And the cherry blossom is very delicate. And towards the end of its life, if you will, it is barely holding on to that branch. And the slightest wind will release it. And when the cherry blossoms release, they sort of shower down like snow, which is what we're seeing on this kimono here, the beautiful showering down of the cherry blossoms. Now these two kimono are meant for different purposes. The darker one on my right here is actually a formal kimono. So you would wear it to a formal event in the evening, whereas the one to the left is an informal kimono. The differences between the two um, are the formal kimono tend to be darker. The formal kimono also tend to have less dense motif. So there certainly is um, flowers that have been applied to this. But if you notice, compare it to the one that's informal, the flowers on this are much denser. They cover more area. So those are two ideas that are traditional in Japanese culture that Hisaku is continuing in the creation of her, her kimono. Also, in the center of each of this, you may notice that there's an area that's less covered by design, right in the middle, in the back. Does anybody have a guess as to why that is? 
I think you're both saying the same answer. That's right. The OB will go around the center. So the artist would know not to spend too much time putting decor right here in an area that would ultimately be covered. Now the OB that you see near the kimono actually are meant to accompany it. So they've been created to be worn with those particular kimono. And again, just like the kimono, the OB motifs would be specific to that season. So we're finishing up spring and we'll move over to the summer. The summertime in Japan, as here, is a warmer time. And so you're not going to want to weigh yourself down with a heavy fabric, fabric, so the fabrics are light and airy. And then in terms of the colors, this is important too. If you notice, the colors are lighter, and there's a lot of blue that's being used. Blue reminds us of water, and water makes us feel cool. So it's sort of a trick of the mind to get us to think about being cooler in a time when it's actually quite warm. What we have here is we have on the right the orchid design, um, which is a flower of the summer. And then we have the blue and white poppies. What I love about the blue and white poppy design over here in the light pink kimono is if you notice, the poppies themselves are sort of uh, kind of moving in a way, moving in the wind, which reminds us of a breeze, of the gentle breeze that we hope to find in summer as we're walking around. So again, it's a trick of the mind to make us think that we're cooler, that we're feeling more comfortable than perhaps we actually are. And again, the kimono that are accompanying them are meant to be worn with them. And in this case, I believe the pattern here, Hisaku has um, been inspired by a, a work that her father has done earlier in life. So throughout this space, she's inspired by her father's designs and sort of recreates them or borrows them directly in the work that she's doing, sort of to keep his legacy going. We wrap around to the back here and we find ourselves in front of the fall kimono. So the weather has cooled down. We have richer color. So these would be typical fall colors for kimono and typical fall flowers. So we have the lilies and the amaryllis. Um, both of these kimono were actually the lightest ones created. So all of these were created within like a 12 year time span, but these were actually created in 2011 specifically for the exhibition. So Hasaku had started this series prior to connecting with the museum, but then when she was connecting with us about doing this exhibition, she completed them for it. So you are some of the first people to ever view these kimono, which is pretty special. And the amaryllis design is also special because as I mentioned, She's borrowing from her father's ideas. She wants to pay tribute to his memory and his legacy. Um, he did pass away in 1993, so she's making these uh, a little less than 10 years after his passing. And the amaryllis design that she's done, this is not a large image, but I'll try to sort of move it around. This is something done 50 years earlier by her father for the cover of a catalog. So she's directly borrowing his motif and turning it into something her own, but I think also honoring him in the process. And finally, we move to winter. And we have two very different looking kimono here. And we have, I believe it's Camila's flower on the right here, and then the plum blossom flower on the left. And the plum blossom does in fact blossom in the winter in Japan, both flowers do actually, which is a nice, Reminder that winter is not as bleak as perhaps we think. And with the plum blossom, when you have an opportunity after this art stop, I encourage you to take a closer look. Not too close, but close. Um, because what you'll notice is these seemingly white flowers are not a flat color. As I mentioned, they were done in layers, so there's a lot of depth there. Subtle changes of tone and color, really, really gorgeous. And against the dark, dark background, to me, it reminds me of the fall of snow, a real winter kind of memory for me. And of course, the obi that accompany them. This one is particularly interesting to the children who tour the exhibition. Um, a rabbit is the feature motif. Anybody have a guess as to why there's a rabbit on the obi in the winter time? This is tricky. Right, the rabbit is actually a, a symbol of the new year. 
So in the Chinese zodiac, you have the year of the rabbit, which in this case, this piece was created, I believe, in 1992. I think the year of the rabbit was a few years before, because we just celebrated the year of the rabbit last year in 2011. Anybody know what year we're in now? Dragon. The dragon, that's right. Very auspicious, very lucky year for all of us. Be happy. Um, but the new year, of course, symbolized a, a hope for the future, a new beginning. So the plum blossom as well is meant to be thought of as sort of an uh, introduction to the, the spring that's coming up right around the corner. So instead of this sort of bleak, wintry feel, we have a real celebration of starting over. And that brings us kind of to the end. We've done a cycle. we have kind of back where we started. Um, I'm going to wrap up this art stop, but I'll say that, as I mentioned, Hisaku is still living. She's a contemporary artist in her 60s. She was very generous and actually came to the museum and did a lecture workshop demonstration of this process. She also generously contributed a um, piece of writing to the museum-generated catalog for this exhibition, where she talks about her father and his life and his memory of her memory of him and of the work that he'd done. And I think, in a way, this exhibition is meant to be a celebration of that, of him, of his contribution to, to the art world and specifically to the Japanese art world. And it's also a celebration of the relationship between the two of them and a reminder that it's not over, that it will continue that the dying part of dying elegance is specific to the process and not the um, continuation of this exciting um, type of art. So I encourage you after this to definitely take a closer look. If you're interested in the process, just around the corner is a very nice display that lays it out step by step. There's a video in the corner that shows how kimono are put on the body. And then, of course, we barely covered a lot of the other beautiful work around here. So please feel free to, to look around and enjoy it. Are there any questions? Yes? Uh, I want to know if she used the same technique as her father in coloring the silk. She did. She did. Um, as I mentioned, she was one of the only people who was successful at, at actually being able to recreate it, which I think must have been very pleasing for her father to have his own daughter be another master of the technique. So she did. So again, the kimono that we see here that are full color, these were all brushed with a brush. These were dyed with a brush, not dipped. Which, if you've ever worked with watercolor to get an even color like that, is very challenging. So she was definitely a master, or is a master of the technique at this point. Any other questions? Thank you so much. I really appreciate all of you joining me, and please feel free to enjoy the rest of the exhibition. Thank you. Thank you.